first like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands from which we are participating in the Embolden Festival and especially honour the wisdom, strength and contributions of First Nations elder women who've really nurtured their communities and culture for generations in the face of extreme adversity. We are now joined by the absolutely fabulous Jess Hill. I hope you'll indulge my wish to save as much time as possible to ask questions of Jess. So do please check out her very impressive biography online. As this is the Emboldened Festival that celebrates all the people, and this year with a special focus on all the women, I'd like to start, Jess, with a very personal question and find out from you, as you were growing up, were there all the women who deeply influenced your worldview or values and what lessons or wisdom did they pass on to you that still resonate with you today? Yeah, sure, Yumi. And hi, everybody. Uh, it's really lovely to be here. I'm zooming in from Gadigal Beach School Land today. And I think when I think back to my childhood and the influence of older women, uh, the the person who towers over my memory um, and who was actually towering over me physically at the time at six foot tall was my nonna. Uh, and she, I lived with my nonna from the time I was about eight and she imbued in me a love of learning and a love of learning on my own terms. So we would set our own homework together I would sit there, I would go up to her place, you know, when I got home from school, she would read me the um, the history of mankind. Um, and yeah. this was a long process, it's a very long book, it took many years. Um, and, <laughs> and she also imbued in me a sense of um, uh, or an investment in advocacy and activism because she she was an advocate for writers particularly. She did a lot of work with Penn International and the Australian Society of Authors um, and so, you know, I would be up at her place. She lived in the, you know, aptly termed granny flat, you know, behind our house. Um, and uh, we would be folding pamphlets together, um, advocating for writers who've been imprisoned overseas. Um, the other, and the other um, older woman who had such a really strong influence on me was my piano teacher, Mrs. Schaffer. And I remember thinking I wasn't raised in a Christian household. I was actually raised in a bit of a new age household. And uh, my my line when I was growing up, and, you know, apologies to any um, Christians online, this is this was my experience as a child, is that I thought that if my mum had been alive um, in the 15 or 1600s, that Christians would have burnt her alive because um, she was practicing astrology. So so that was my experience. So, but Mrs. Schaffer was was a practicing Christian. She was very devoted to her church, and what I loved about her was that, um, you know, sometimes when my mum would bring me to piano lessons, Mrs. Schaffer would ask her about astrology. She would, you know, she was always just kind and attentive and accepting of everybody, no matter who they were, and it actually gave me a real appreciation for like true Christian behavior in the in the sort of tradition of, you know, Jesus um, and Jesus as a social worker type of Jesus. Um, so, yeah, so the, those two older women uh, really loom quite large in, in my mind and I guess spiritually they, they were very important to me. Right, Jess, I suppose we can really see the influence of your activist grandmother in the work that you're doing. And so this brings me to the question of the work that you have been doing. I know you started researching about domestic violence 10 years ago and trying to understand the phenomena, you know, to find out who the perpetrators are and how women will be impacted. And that article that you wrote in The Guardian 10 years ago, you said, um, it wasn't until I'd spent months researching and writing about it that I began to understand why most people don't get domestic violence. It doesn't make sense. So thinking back to that time when you started 10 years ago to today, what has changed since you wrote that piece in The Guardian? Mm. Well, I think that 
you know, part of why I was saying that it it didn't make sense is that, you know, the sorts of questions that people had in the forefront of their life, of their mind, like, why doesn't she just leave? Why does she go back? Um, you know, not many people were yet asking, why does he do that? Um, and that's something I think that has changed over the past 10 years. It's a much greater focus on why particularly men use violence and coercive control. But I think a lot of those reasons why domestic violence didn't make sense, I think we've started to make better sense of it in the past decade. So we have, for example, across government and a much greater understanding amongst community that that uh, coercive control is the underpinning dynamic of almost all family violence. So we, you know, the domestic violence sector had long known that domestic violence and abuse was was mostly about power and control. Um, this wasn't new to them necessarily, but what is new, I think, in terms of our understanding, is just the predominance of those controlling in coercive tactics and also how weird they can be. So, for example, the predominance of, of surveillance and using um, secret apps in phones, uh, GPS trackers in cars, secret recording tiles in teddy bears, um, the setting of, of trivial sort of rules, micro-regulating the victim survivors' lives. So that that sort of element of family violence was very much underground when I first started researching it a decade ago. And and now we have not only much greater understanding and agreement across governments about how much coercive control underpins family violence, but we even have law reform in several states, New South Wales, Queensland, and South Australia, that has made coercive control illegal. And that, that law is now operational in New South Wales and will be in Queensland in 2025, and I think in two years in South Australia. So that's a that's a huge change, and it's and it's about really recognizing that family violence is not just a collection or uh, of incidents or a one off incident. Um, that almost always underpinning those incidents is a deeper dynamic, uh, and and that's and that's now becoming much more visible to systems and services. So that's one part. I think also what we've seen is um, a greater emphasis on the way that perpetrators will use any system they can to entrap their partners and their children and that that includes government systems, it includes private um, companies, it includes things like banking and insurance. Uh, so there's been much greater focus on that over the last few years and how these systems and products are weaponized. Um, I think there's also been a much greater emphasis on lived experience and how that needs to be central to both the design and the implementation of policy. So that was really, I guess, kicked off to a large extent by Rosie Batty's advocacy, also recognising that, you know, there had the whole domestic family violence sector um, was founded basically on lived experience. You know, so many of those women who, for example, worked in the refuges had had either experienced it themselves before or who had lived in the refuges and then went on to work in them. So, you know, the the domestic violence sector had been full of lived experience and, and has always been, um, but lived experience as its own sort of particular advocacy group has really just become so much more central in the last decade. And very recently, Young people are being more included in that in that category and in those consultations, and and I think I mean we could go on forever, but I mean I, I think there's been just massive changes in the past decade. Um, and the last one that I would mention that I think is really important is the long-awaited changes to the Family Law Act. So the revoking of that presumption of equal shared parenting parental responsibility, which had really created an, an environment in which abusers thought they had um, the right to have equal custody of their children and they would fight tooth and nail to get it. Um, and it led to a lot of very dangerous decisions um, in terms of where children were to live. So we're seeing just massive changes across the family law system, not enough yet, but, but a real increase in understanding. And even in the past year, 
we've seen an enormous increase in the um, in the amount of conversation about the role of alcohol and other substances in family violence and what sorts of prevention we can use to address that, the role of childhood trauma in perpetration. So I feel like this is just, you know, we're looking at this massive onion and we just keep on unpeeling layers and layers and layers of it. And we and we keep thinking that we're getting closer to the core only to find that actually as we unpeel all the layers, we're, we're, we're finding out that we didn't even know that layer existed. We didn't even know that that was important until we were able to peel away all the other layers and get to that, you know, that that otherwise concealed part. So I think it's been a it's been a very accelerated program of awareness and change. Um, Jess, I find it really interesting to hear you talk about the various layers of the onion. And the fact that now there is a focus on children and trying to address childhood trauma as a preventative measure. And we see this so clearly in the work that we're doing with all the women in our Hear Our Voices project, where we are developing training resources to assist frontline workers to better respond to disclosures of sexual assault. Um, by all the women. And as part of this process, we have been running body mapping workshops with all the women. And it is so clear to us from everything that so many of the older women have told us is that their experience of violence actually starts from childhood. Yeah. And, and they have grown old with violence. And, um, you know, it, we absolutely need to go back to childhood and do everything we can to provide the wraparound services that children need because the impact of the violence is felt even in old age. So, you know, until I began working at the Older Women's Network, when someone said domestic violence, the picture I have in my mind's eye is of a younger woman and children. And I think this is generally the case for a lot of people. And, you know, we know that it's not just younger women and children who experience DB. So why do you think that is the case, that we've forgotten all the women? Mm. Well... I mean, a number of reasons and, and reasons that you um, and and everyone at the Older Women's Network advocate so strongly on, uh, primarily that older women are just generally invisibilized. Um, so I, I'm 41. I figure I've gotten about another five or six years before I become completely invisible. <laughs> um, but, you know, but, the, you know, and it's and it's not a joke. Like, I mean, it's really I've noticed that happen with with my own mother um, and the and the effect that it had on her. Um, that feeling that society just doesn't see you anymore. Um, but And I think that, so the number of reasons, including that general invisibilization, is that, you know, in stock photo images, uh, the sorts that you would see um, accompanying articles about this issue, but also the posters you see in hospitals and police stations, they commonly depict young women, um, young white attractive women often, um, who have been physically um, abused. And and there's, uh, there's lots of reasons for that that aren't sort of conspiratorial um, or, you know, or um, ageism. And, that's, and that is because younger women are more likely to seek specialist help. Um, and, and I think that for generations you had older women who really felt there was no way out of a marriage characterized by coercive control, um, that that on the other side of leaving was likely to be social ostracization, massive fa financial disadvantage, um, you know, exile from family. So there's a sense of this cohort of older women living deeper underground than other victim survivors, um, much less likely to surface and seek help. So that that's part of it. I think that so in Scotland, when they brought in coercive control laws there, there was a a, um, a project that was run by Scottish Women's Aid and a group called Zero Tolerance, and they basically created uh, a series of stock images to go with 
the 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 media that would be reporting on coercive control courses of behavior so they wouldn't be just reporting on physical assaults that because you know the the, the what was a crime had changed um and what they depict uh is both they have you know cultural diversity which is different um they have the presence of children but they also have older women um and a number of photos with older women and all the women also pictured not just alone, but pictured w- with others um, who are assisting them. Um, and I think that that's really critically important that there's this sense of older women having community, having people that will come to their aid, um, because often older women are really portrayed as being very isolated. Um, so I guess that there needs to be, you know, as Own does so well, there actually needs to be a conscious effort to visibilize older women because just it seems like just an instinctive reaction. And partly this goes back to, you know, what we saw with the so-called silent generation, you know, as 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 women get older, they uh, women and men get older, they they wouldn't be as they they wouldn't participate so much in in the public debate and public conversation. They wouldn't complain about their issues. Now hopefully I think with the baby boomers aging, we're going to see lots of complaining um, <laughs> and public complaining. And, you know, we're already seeing things like, um, you know, as Gen X ages, we're seeing menopause and perimenopause becoming like huge issues, whereas before they were barely talked about. So it's pretty clear that issues are like the, uh, around aging are becoming much more prevalent and public as that population both like changes in terms of its behaviour and, and and the society it grew up in and what it came to expect, but also changes in terms of um, its size. Like the, just the sheer size of the older population is going to go through the roof and is already doing that. So hopefully we will start to see that shift, but it doesn't it doesn't happen just through hope. It, it does happen through advocacy, as you know. Yes. Uh, you know, in line with just thinking about domestic violence as a younger women's issue, if you were to reflect on the homicide rate from last year, for example, uh, I think the data shows that 23 older women died in family violence homicide. So, you know, what do we lose when we don't see older women as targets? And what do you think the key issues are and what can we do better? Yeah, so look, there are people with greater expertise in this than I, but what I noticed, and particularly during the work on the rapid review into prevention, we looked very specifically at um, older women who'd become victim to homicide. And so there's there's multiple issues. A number of those homicides are committed by sons um, rather than adult partners, and I think society still finds it very hard to confront the issue of matricide. Um, it feels, I mean, no no homicide feels natural, but that feels particularly like it's going against nature. Um, and so I think that there's, there's even some taboo around that. Um, there's, there's also a greater chance of homicides in older women by their partners that might be preceded by issues like dementia or other sort of environmental stresses, which doesn't fit the general narrative of men who do it just for power and control or do it because they can. So so I think sometimes because we have become so fixed on on a particular subset um, of the female population being being younger, you know, sort of like age 20, 24 to 50, let's say, um, those sorts of other factors just complicate this this story that people would still like to keep a bit simple. Um, so that's that's I think part of it. But I think the stories of older women who have been impacted by family violence are also much more complex. Um, You're often also dealing with comorbidities, could be disabilities, could be other health issues. Um, So it is harder to fit into that, like, simple, memorable story. Um, But I think, you know, a real lesson for advocacy around um, older women, what's been really successful, um, you know, horribly, because of the statistics are horrible and shocking, but has been the growing number of older women who end up homeless. Um, and the, and I think a lot of people can cite that fact that older women are the, are the fastest growing 
population group faced by faced with homelessness. Um, so that's where we've seen a, a much an unusual visibility of older women in this discussion, and and a growing connection between that homelessness and histories of family violence. So that's definitely had cut through, I think, because it's shocking to people. Um, and and I guess that's why, you know, in terms of the National Action Plan and others, that's where you see some actions really sort of like focused around older women because that advocacy has had such cut through. Um, but it is by no means the only almost important thing facing older women who are impacted by family violence. So, Jess, you mentioned the national plan and, you know, the new one for the first time takes a lifespan approach, which is, you know, a great relief to us after a lot of advocacy that's gone in there. And, you know, we were also really pleased to see that the committee that you were in that drafted that rapid review report um, identified all the women as a priority group. So can you, you know, provide some insights as to why you felt it was important to do that. Yeah, sure. I mean, and yeah, and then what does this mean in practical terms for mm -hmm. our prevention, you know, activities? Absolutely. So we felt it was really important to highlight older women particularly because they so rarely are included or centred Um it's not, and, and in some cases, you're talking about completely different strategies to address their needs. In other cases, it's, it's actually just about having an older women's lens on existing strategies. Um, so, so, for example, in terms of like where do we practically see that manifesting most, you know, in, in, a, in a way that's really strong, one of the uh, priority areas that we had um, was to activate the health sector. And by that, we mean that, you know, sure, it's very important that we support specialist services and it's sort of like a baseline expectation that we need to be able to fund those services to meet demand, both current and future. But when you look at the number of employees across those specialist services, uh, um, they are dwarfed by the number of um, healthcare workers. And not only that, when you then also look at who, who do um, victims of family violence, who do perpetrators of family violence access for help um, either for the violence or for other issues where the violence may actually become visible? Um, it's uh, other than friends and family, it's primarily healthcare professionals. And that's especially true for older women. Um, and I think the fact that you have older women going to see healthcare professionals increasingly as they age and as they need more assistance, but also more likely to have a, a personal GP and someone who gets to know them over time. Um, that's why we, in that in that prevention review, we recommended that family violence training be mandated for GPs, um, be also mandated for psychologists as a requirement for their registration. So I think that I mean, we saw in in multiple coronial reports, including a recent coronial report, include uh, that that covered the um, matricide uh, of a mother by her son, the failure of GPs to pick up on both disclosures and red flags in the lead up to that homicide. And so, I mean, coroners have been recommending for ten years that GPs be mandated to have training for family violence. Um, incredible work from groups like Safer Families in Melbourne, led by Professor Kelsey Hegarty and others. I mean, there's so much, there's been so much advocacy on this point, but so much stubbornness on behalf of the uh, the colleges and the peak bodies for, for healthcare professionals um, and resistance to taking this on as a mandatory requirement. At the moment, the only mandatory training requirement outside of their initial schooling for GPs is CPR. Um, and what we're what we really wanted to position this is we're talking about critical homicide and suicide prevention work that GPs can play a much more central role in, and particularly for older women, but really, I mean, across the life course. Um, so so that's part of how we would like to see it working in practice. Um, but yeah, I think generally 
it was so important just to name older women as a priority group and really to say, we want the lenses of these various priority groups put across every recommendation in this report. So um, just you talk about um, fa- family domestic violence. Just if, if we can just shift the so- uh, focus a little bit and look at sexual assault because sexual assault is often part of family violence, but it seems to be spoken of a lot less than other aspects, for example, financial abuse. Um, and so, and especially if, when it relates to all the women, mm. what do you think needs to change? Well, it's interesting you should say um, less than financial abuse because when I first started uh, working in this area, financial and economic abuse was barely mentioned at all. Um, so and I think what that tells you is that things that or, you know, factors that can be completely invisibilized um, can have their moment where they, they come up to the surface and start and it's like that they've always been around. So with sexual violence, I mean, we've gone through, you know, we had – Back back in the day, you know, we had rape and domestic violence crisis centres. You know, the inclusion of the term rape and in the inclusion of the term sexual violence was much more front and centre. Um, now, they got stripped away out of a lot of titles um, of, of centres, um, of helplines. And so I think what really um, what we're seeing now is as a greater push um, from the sector. So, for example, when we're when we're using the term, it's long, but to say family, domestic, and sexual violence, for example, one of the um, one of the recommendations we made in the review was to expand the priority area of sexual violence in the national action plan to look across the whole spectrum of sexual violence, whether that be incest whether it be sexual violence from an intimate partner, whether it be sexual violence in aged care, um, but across the whole experience of sexual violence, um, rather than what it has been, what it, what it was focused on more uh, in in the national action plan at the moment, which was largely around sexual harassment um, and stuff around respect at work. So there's, I think, the fact that. You know, sexual violence, perhaps more than any other type of violence, is is in heterosexual um, scenarios almost strictly gendered. Um, I mean, coercive control is almost strictly gendered. When we look at family violence, you know, we can talk about male victims at this. We can talk, you know, and there's there's all these there's lots of different caveats and and different um, focus areas in sexual violence. The gendered nature of it is quite distinct. Now, obviously, in LGBTQI relationships um, and LGBTQI scenarios, if non-binary men, women, trans people perpetrating this type of abuse, um, but but I think that it takes such again, like such a concerted effort to get people to pay attention. It's something that is so private and such a, a like a deep place of intimacy even more so than family violence. You know, we say it happens behind closed doors. Well, sexual violence happens behind the closed door behind the closed door. You know, that's the sense. And and I think that it's very difficult for people to speak openly about it. It's often, you know, it's you. Know, it's, I saw this so often when I was researching the book. You talk to a victim survivor who'd pressed charges and gone through with, you know, uh, the court proceedings against their partner and the sexual violence charges would be dropped in a plea deal. It was like they it the the urge to invisibilize the sexual violence aspect of the family violence was so strong that that, that you even saw it being invisibilized from the charge sheet. Um so yeah, I mean there's there is no other way to pull this back up into the uh, into the focus of our attention other than doing that through advocacy and just making sure that we continue to include and to and to uplift the sexual violence sector, um, and to use those words that have become taboo, like incest um, and others, and and not shy away from it. It's I I think we cannot talk about sexual violence today just without also talking about Giselle Pellico in France at this point in time, 
And it, the the fact that you said, you know, it's so taboo, it's so silent, it's so behind the behind the closed door in speaking about it and addressing it. But the fascinating thing at the same time is that you have a community of perpetrators who mm-hmm. within their closed doors speak so freely of, you know, uh, perpetrating sexual assault and sexual violence that, you know, they have this incredible freedom to do that and invite each other uh, to perpetrate sexual violence. So, you know, it seems like such, you know, the cognitive dissonance is is there just for me to try to comprehend this. Oh, and what a heroine. I mean, like, Giselle, to to come forward and be known for the worst things that have happened to her and in doing so expose the men who did it um, and to not have that trial happen behind closed doors was just, I can't even fathom what that has taken for her to do that and for her children to also, you know, be so visible in that. Um, And I think that probably part of what it's revealed that's, shocking and disturbing for those who are kind of, especially for those who are, uh, are less initiated um, into this type of discourse is, is as you say, like the free um, exchange about assaulting a drugged woman that was happening online and, um, and the arrangement of uh, made by otherwise seemingly normal men who were living in the community. Um, and, and I think that the fact that they could speak so openly about that I guess, as you say, stands in really distinct contrast to the op- the comfort that we have as a society of talking openly about that. Um, so, you know, I guess we just need to learn how to talk as openly about sexual violence as a rapist does. Yes, absolutely, Jess. So um, in our work for All the Women Count, which you know, celebrate aging and own belief is the only national primary prevention program targeting culture change for all the women. We're aiming to transform ageism and sexism, which all the women experience and internalize. Um, so where all the women are frequently portrayed as just grannies without an identity of their own. So Thinking about the time when you are 70, Jess, what words would you like to use to describe yourself as an older woman? Hmm. Well, as someone who lives with the the shadow of chronic illness, the first one would be alive. Um, and, 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 and then, but others would be uh, tenacious, kind, but never so polite that she wasn't willing to stand up for what she believed, um, supportive and collaborative and loving, pioneering and trailblazing, and still committed to the work. Thank you so much, Jess. You don't have to be 90 to claim those titles. We'll give it to you straight out there. <laughs> so please join me, everyone, in thanking Jess, and we really appreciate the work that you're doing to bring light to this very dark issue. Thank you so much, Jess. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Yuri.